This is the day that the Lord has made, so we have gathered this morning to rejoice and be glad in it. And yes, we have gathered. If you are at home, if you are sitting around your television or your computer, still we are all gathered in one spirit together to worship Jesus Christ. And since you are worshiping with us this morning, let us know that you're here. You can go to fumc2plo.com forward slash I'm here and register your attendance. Let us know that you are worshiping with us this morning. Also, don't forget, though you might have missed it this morning or you might have been a part of it this morning, we have various Sunday school classes that are meeting each Sunday in the 10 o'clock hour. You can see on your screen the various offerings that are available. You can also go to our website, fumctupelo.com, and find the listings and login information there. And while you're thinking about it, while you're online, make sure that you are following us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are simply at FUMC Tupelo. I also want you to know that this summer we have had the privilege of having with us Sam Blades. He is our ministry intern with the Church Leadership Cooperative. Sam is from Madison, Alabama, though I knew him when he was significantly shorter um, at Starfall First UMC in my time there. And he is presently uh, beginning his junior year at Mississippi State. And Sam is a leader in the Mississippi State University uh, Wesley Foundation. He and others have been serving churches in the Starkville District uh, for the past year or two. So thank you, Sam, for being with us. Um, and you will want to go to our Facebook page, not right now, but later, and listen to Sam's message and might as well watch the whole service at the invitation. Um, he gave us a fabulous message this morning there. Well, that is a little of what is going on in the life of our church. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. I invite you now, wherever you are, to stand and let us join together in our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's holy name. Rejoice in the Lord. God fills our hearts with joy. Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim God's mighty works. Rejoice in the Lord. God's miracles are a wonder to behold. Give thanks to the Lord. Trust in God's salvation. Rejoice in the Lord. God turns even our failings into glory.
Let us pray. O oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the, inf- in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit, that we may know that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing, sing to him. him. Sing, sing praises, praises to him. him. Tell, Tell all his, his wondrous works. works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of the servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. When he summoned famine against the land and broke every staff of bread. He was a man and a man, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron. Until what he said came to pass, the word of the Lord came testing you. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions, to instruct his officials at his pleasure, and to teach his elders wisdom. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Good morning. Um, I'm excited this morning to get to share with you um, a video that we recorded over the past few weeks. Since we were unable to hold baccalaureate services in person as we normally would, we decided to have small in-person anointing services with each graduate. Um, Please join us in watching the video of those services now.
Having these moments with each family was um, so special to me as the youth pastor here at FUMC. And uh, the one thing that's particularly special about this is that even though we didn't get to come together in person and send off these students together, um, we as a church still get to be this community even while we're apart. And so today um, I ask that you join us in a prayer for blessing or prayer of blessing. We prayed this over the students individually, but would like to pray this over them collectively. Join me now. Eternal God, whose steadfast love for us is from everlasting to everlasting. We give you thanks for cherished memories and for the work you have begun in our students' lives. We commend them into your care and anoint them with your blessings as they enter into a new community to learn and grow. When they are afraid, give them courage. When they feel weak, grant them your strength. When they are afflicted, afford them your patience. When they are lost, offer them hope. When they are alone, move us to their side. Keep these students in your love and care forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scripture today is from Genesis 37, beginning with verse 1. Before we read it, let's pray together. O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your Scriptures are read and your Word proclaimed, we would hear with joy what you would speak to us today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear the Word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 37. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, 
being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round them, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and my mother and thy brethren indeed come, da- come and bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said to one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let, him, let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And, Je- and Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness." And lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, A company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. And they passed by the Midianites' merchantmen, And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, we're hearing a a lot of voices just now. And I I mean, in in the passage that we have just read, there are so many voices about. We begin with the the voice of the narrator sort of arching over the whole story and telling us that this is the story, these are the generations, this is the lineage of Jacob. This is going to be a story about what happens to Jacob's people. 
And we, we begin with this sense, this voice that tells us that, that things are going somewhere. We end, uh, as sometimes we do, reading a passage of Scripture and we come to this horrible ending. Joseph has been sold off into slavery and, and we immediately respond, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. And, and sometimes our hearts aren't quite in it. But the way that the narrator gives it to us is telling us that God is going to do something with this story that to us may seem so terrible. We begin with that voice. But there are other voices as well. We hear the voice of Jacob. First, it's sort of an implied voice along with the narrator. And we can imagine what Jacob might have been saying as he brings his son Joseph in and he favors him, just like Jacob's own mother uh, had favored him. And he puts his arm around him and he puts this glorious coat on him. And he, and he, and he gives him special preference because he's the son of his old age. And he gives them this uh, as I read, I wanted to read the King James because it keeps the classic line that you all know, the coat of many colors, right? He has this coat, this beautiful coat of many colors. Other translations will say that he has a coat of long sleeves. That sounds pretty fancy too, right? We hear jo Jacob caring for this boy, even if we don't hear the exact words. We hear his voice of favoritism over him. Uh, the, his voice saying, come on, son, let's, uh, let's go visit Jack Reed. Where's Lisa? Back there. We're going to get you a fancy coat. Joe Yarbrough, if we're out there. Maybe they went to MLM, too. They, I mean, they, they are setting Joseph up, right? You hear this tender voice over him, right? Joseph is going to be uh, not in the hard work of being a shepherd. He's going to be in management, even though he's one of the younger brothers. And you notice what Jacob does. He sends Joseph out to check on his brothers who were about to, to, you'll remember already, and we're about to talk about the fact that they can't speak peaceably to them. And Jacob sends Joseph out with a word. He's supposed to go and see if all is well with them. The word there is shalom. He's going to see if things are at peace with them, if things are whole and complete. And so we hear Jacob's voice tenderly over this beloved, uh, treasured son. But then we hear Joseph's voice. And i got to say, I don't like hearing Joseph's voice. I am with his brothers. I'm with Jacob. Uh, and, uh, and saying that, you know, what is with this kid? Is he arrogant? Is he just naive? He tells us these dreams where he, he lifts himself over all of the rest of us. And no wonder his brothers hate him. The words that we hear Joseph speaking, his voice that we hear, is the voice of a tattletale, right? He brings his, uh, his father a bad report of what all the big brothers are doing. We hear Joseph's voice, and this won't be the last time. Then we hear this voice of someone else that we don't, we don't know his name. He's the man in the field. And he says, who are you looking for when Joseph comes to find his brothers? And as I hear that line, there's this sense of foreboding, foreshadowing even with it. Who are you looking for? There's more to come. There's more just around the story, not just in what we read today, but always in Joseph's story. There's more just around the corner. There's more to be seen. Who are you looking for? And then we hear the voice of the brothers. We know from the beginning that they cannot speak peaceably to Joseph. And eventually we will hear them conspiring with words of death. I mean, their actions are bad enough, but their actions come from the words that they first use together against their brother. And so we hear their voice. But there's one voice that we haven't heard. It's a voice that over the last several weeks as we've been preaching through Genesis and this series, Dawn, that we've, we've become accustomed to hearing. It's God's. What does God have to say? Here in this story of Jacob, where's God? God strikes us with silence. Now, it's, it's not that God doesn't know how to speak. God's been speaking all through Genesis. We've heard God speaking over these last few months. Uh, and, and when we preached through Genesis 1, right, we heard in creation the refrain again and again of God's voice, let there be. And the thing comes into existence over six days of creation. God's voice has so much power that it can create the world. He speaks it into being. And then God speaks promises. He promises Abraham, in you, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
And he promises him these, all of these descendants. Right? God speaks directly to Abraham. And not just Abraham. God speaks to his son, Isaac. We first hear God's voice on behalf of Isaac when Abraham has carried him up the mountain at God's command, and Abraham is poised to kill his son, and then the voice of God intervenes and does something. And later in Isaac's own life, we didn't preach through this, but it's, it's right there in Genesis if you want to read through, the Lord will appear to Isaac when there's a famine in the land, and he will tell Isaac, don't go down to Egypt, just where Joseph is going to go. Don't go down to Egypt. Settle in the land that I will show you. Reside in the land as an alien. I will be with you, and I will bless you. And for to you and to your descendants, I will give all of these lands, and I will fulfill the oath that I swore to your father, Abraham. He reiterates the promise. He makes it again that he made to Abraham. And not just Isaac. Isaac's son, Jacob, too. God will speak to him. And when, when Jacob will have a dream of angels ascending and descending. You heard that preached a few weeks ago. You will hear God speaking to Jacob saying, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God speaks to Jacob. And even when God doesn't speak to Jacob, God does something even better. God is up, to, up face to face with Jacob. Jacob, as you heard, will wrestle with God in the night. And when he realizes that it's been the angel of the Lord or the Lord, however you want to put it, that he's been with, he, realize, he realizes that he has seen God face to face and God gives him a new name. And so on the basis of everything that we have read in Genesis so far, we would expect for God to say something, to speak up, to have some word for Joseph in the pit. What will God say in the pit? Let's just put ourselves back there. Imagine 17-year-old Joseph, favored, pampered son, in the pit. Cold, dark, I presume. Um, I don't know what Levantine pits are like, but he is in it, right? Walls stark on either side. Uh, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. What will God say? A single word from the creating God who made all things could change everything. A single word of promise, like to Abraham, or to reiterate it like God did to Isaac and Jacob, uh, to keep him from going down into Egypt like he, like he told to Isaac. Even, even I bet Joseph would have loved in that moment for God to show up and wrestle with him in the pit. After all, doesn't Joseph dream dreams? But it never happens. God doesn't say anything to Joseph. Now, we, I think sometimes we think of Joseph as one of the more spiritual of, of, right, the, of the patriarchs. We he dreams these dreams and can interpret them. And these dreams presumably come from God. Uh, Joseph later in his life interpreting dreams to some people that he's been imprisoned with and eventually to Pharaoh will say that interpretation comes from God. There is some sense, and, and we will hear again and again in Joseph's story, if you were to continue reading on through Genesis 50, that God is with Joseph. God is with him. God can give him interpretation of these dreams, but we never hear, not one time, what we hear for all the rest, God speaking to him. And it's not like God is done speaking to people. God will speak to many others after Joseph. He will speak to Joshua and Samuel and David and Nathan and Solomon, all kinds of prophets, but not to Joseph the dreamer. Joseph represents this departure from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We we're told at the beginning, this is the story of Jacob. Interestingly, not the story of Joseph, though Joseph dominates the story. And it strikes me that Joseph's situation is much like ours. We may have dreams, right? Uh, we, may, we have revelation from God. We may even know and can say with fullness, like Joseph does, that God is with us. But often, I would say that we feel like we don't hear from God 
like so many people in the Bible heard directly from God. And we may wonder, what does God have to say? We are in the pit with Joseph. There's a universal refrain for those of us in the pit right now, those of us in the pit here in Tupelo, uh, at least a universal refrain among Tupelo parents. What are y'all going to do about school this year? People want to know. Everybody's trying to make hard decisions that make the most sense for themselves and their family. Uh, I think uh, so many prayers have arisen for you, our teachers. Uh, I know for me and my family they have for you, our teachers, and folks on our school board and our superintendent, our whole school district, and and all of the schools around as well, beyond Tupelo. And and we want to know what's going to happen. We want to know that our kids are going to be safe. We're in this particular iteration of all of the of the chaos of, the, of 2020 and the coronavirus, right? We're wondering what to do. And we would all love a voice from the Lord to show up and say, this is exactly what you should do. And the coronavirus is gone, right? That's what we all want to hear. But it's not just those things too. And we look out, I think right now in the state of our world and often we feel like we are in a pit. Um, this is true of this particular year and time, but it's really true of all time, right? But now we look out and it's not just COVID-19, I sense a deep sense of anxiety as I talk to people, uh, people across the ideological and political spectrum, right? People are, are watching the, the protests and the, the, uh, the government reaction in Portland, and they find it deeply disturbing. You may have heard the news this week of the Hagia Sophia, this ancient church in Istanbul, uh, formerly Constantinople, one of the most ancient Christian churches that for the last several decades had been a museum. Well, the repressive government of Turkey, the authoritarian government, has taken it over and declared that it can now only be used as a mosque and no longer for these other purposes. We look out and we see uh, the racial strife of the last several months and people calling out for justice. And of course, that's nothing new too. I learned this week that if you go to Memphis and visit the Lorraine Motel where Martin Luther King was killed, there is a line from, uh, uh, from Genesis 37 on the plaque there. They said to one another, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Right there at the Lorraine Motel. Not just in those things. In the ordinary things, too. Most everyone right now has not only all of the particular chaos of this year, but all kinds of things going on in our own lives. Struggle with health and finances, people who are battling uh, addictions, people who are uh, facing all kinds of hard prospects, all kinds of difficult things in their lives. It's true not just of 2020, but of all time. We all have those struggles and those things that are about us, and we wonder this year and every year, what does God have to to say. God will never speak directly to Joseph in the same way that we often wish that God would speak to us. And I would venture to guess that very few of you have had the kind of appearances that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have had, where God shows up face to face, and there's no doubt this is the voice of the Lord from heaven. Uh, We may know that God is with us. We may hear God in other ways, but we never hear that direct speech, just as Joseph never hears that direct speech, those direct words from God. And yet, and yet, there is this refrain that runs through Joseph's story. God is with him. And it runs through, we can't do all of Genesis 37 through 50, but I hope you know the story. If you don't, go back and just read it. It's fascinating. It runs through the whole Uh, of Joseph's life. He goes into Egypt and eventually uh, becomes a servant to Potiphar and is betrayed and lied about by Potiphar's wife and sent into prison. Uh, And he's in prison and there and he interprets the dreams of some other people who've been the Pharaoh's servants who've been put into prison. And then because he's been able to interpret those dreams a few years after that, after he's been in prison, uh, he's brought into Pharaoh's household and rises to become the second in command of all of Egypt. And eventually his own brothers, when another famine comes, will come down into Egypt to get food because you can always rely on Egypt to have food uh, because of the Nile. And all through that, God is with Jacob. God is with him. God is with him. God is with him. We don't hear God speaking in the same way, but 
God is with him. And after long years of Joseph's tragedy and trauma and his triumphs, his brothers at last come to stand before him for the second time, and at last, again, you'll have to read the story, they find out that this is Joseph in front of them when they had not realized it before. And of course, they are guilt-stricken and terrified because the brother that they sold into slavery is now the second in command of Egypt and could do anything with them that he wanted to. And what Joseph says to them is this in Genesis 50, 20. Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people. Remember the promise to Abraham as he is doing today. It turns out that the pit itself is the dream that needs interpreting. And the interpretation only comes on the other side of Joseph's life when his brothers are before in front of him. And he sees the meaning that he could not possibly have seen before. It comes at length of years. And so how will we interpret our time? What is the meaning of our pit? You know, I'm not comfortable with people who will have a ready diagnosis about everything that God is doing. Who will say God has sent this or that tragedy for this reason. I'm, I think, even less comfortable with people who will outright dismiss that God might have something to say and might do something with the very worst things that we face. I think a God that's worth worshiping, a God that's worth anything, can take the very worst thing and bring something good out of it. A God that's God can take evil and turn it good. If, 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 a, if a being can't do that, that being is not God. And we see that most gloriously and triumphantly and truly in God Himself in Jesus Christ, who is sold not for 20 pieces of silver like, uh, like Joseph, but for 30 pieces, who faces death itself on a cross and facing the worst and most evil thing turns it into good in his death and resurrection. You see, God will speak again. And the word that God has spoken is the word of Jesus Christ. And that word does not excuse evil, as some of us would do, or say, oh, this thing that happened wasn't really all that bad. The pit is an objective evil. The cross is an objective evil. And yet, by the cross, God in Jesus Christ brings resurrection and makes all things new. God will speak again. And so we can say with Psalm 85, let me hear what the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. And so we wait. We just wait. All the things that we face and go through, we just wait. We don't have to explain it. We don't have to understand it. We just wait. Patience may take a lifetime. The verdict may come at the span of years. It may go from chapter 37 to chapter 50. It may be like the story of Jacob's own waiting to see his son Joseph again. The patience may take 430 years because this is how the people of God and Israel wind up in slavery in Egypt. And there will come another Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph and they will find themselves enslaved and God will speak again 430 years later through Moses to bring them out. The promise of God's Word is, is what enables us to wait. His Word in Jesus Christ. And it's His power to overcome even death that gives us endurance. And it is here in the midst of things that are objectively wrong and bad that the dawn of blessing comes where God will make all things new. Now, I want you to hear me. I'm not saying do nothing. In fact, all Christian activity, the most active of our doing good and serving others and calling for justice, is waiting. We are enabled to do those things because we rest in what God can do rather than what we can accomplish. And if we have confidence in that, then we can rely on God's time and give, have it give us life and, and action and, and all of the things that we need to do to work for goodness and justice in this world that God has, has given us because we are waiting in God. I think right now we uh, often are sensing the span of time move faster than we ourselves and our own power can, can really do anything with. I sense this every week with my own kids. Uh, I don't know if y'all know this. Most of the parents here, I hope, know this. 
uh, Carla, uh, our, our youth, uh, or excuse me, our children's director has what I call the Doomsday app. Uh, it's called Parent Q. Uh, on the Doomsday app, they have all of the lessons for like all the Sunday school lessons and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and stuff day by day you can look and, and it pro provokes you to have uh, or prods you to have conversations with your kids about your faith and to help you teach. And this is available to us all the time, but it's really handy right now. But I call it the Doomsday app um, because on it too, it tells you how many weeks you have until your children um, presumably graduate from high school and go off to college or go to work or presumably leave the house. I have 573 weeks until Emmy moves on, it says. 625 weeks until Abigail moves on. 776 weeks until Alexis moves on. And this stresses me out. Right. What will we do with those weeks? I can't possibly teach or do enough or give them enough in my own power. Right? But it turns out if we have the hope of Joseph's kind of timekeeping, if we wait with God, then God can take our meagerness in each and every one of those weeks, and not just the weeks of tracking how our kids will grow through parent cue and all of the things that we have to do, but God can take every one of those moments, those precious moments, and bring His power into them. We can rest knowing that He will bring us where He will have us and will shepherd us and be with us. And so we, in the midst of that, can can, uh, as St. David of Wales said, be joyful, keep the faith, do the little things. We can do what we can do resting in knowing that it is God's time that we are waiting in. And God will bring us, His beloved, to His meaning and purpose for those of us who have, have believed in Him. I have one more story I want to tell you. It's the story of a saint, a saint from the 19th century, his name is St. Mark Xi uh, Tinjang. Uh, we'll call him Xi. Xi uh, was a respectable doctor, a Christian doctor in 19th century China. And he was a good man. He would treat the poor without charging them any fee. Uh, but one day he became ill with a stomach ailment uh, and was in great pain and began to treat himself with opium. Very reasonable thing to do. That's what they had available at the time, but soon he became addicted to the drug. It's a story that could equally be told in 2020. And this addiction was, just became you know, shameful to himself and his family, and he, and he would try and try and try to overcome it. He would go to confession again and again, but he couldn't seem to break its power. And in the 19th century, they didn't understand addiction as a disease like we do today. And so his priest told him that he was not allowed to receive communion. That's not how we understand it, but that's how they understood it then. And so then he goes for decades without receiving communion, the Lord's table, the Eucharist. And, but he keeps the faith all of those years. He continues to pray. Uh, he even prays that he would die a martyr because he believed that was the only way that he could, he could prove his faithfulness to God. And years later, 30-some-odd years later, uh, there is a war, the Boxer Rebellion, that arises in China, and, and, and uh, there, there is a turn against foreigners and Christians, and Xi and his family are taken prisoner. And his family is all martyred before he is. And everyone expected that this guy, this weak man, right, the opium addict, would recant his faith, that he couldn't possibly be strong enough. But he is the one, Xi is the one, who endures past everyone else, until the very end. And he dies professing faith in God uh, on his lips, speaking faith in God. And he's been canonized with Catholics, he's a Catholic saint. He endures to the end. And I have to think that maybe all that he went through, all of the, the horrors of his addiction and disease, gave him the endurance for this terrible moment where he was the one who proved faithful. In the midst of our weakness, in the midst of our waiting, God is there and can redeem it all and can bear witness to His faithfulness to us. And so brothers and sisters, I want you to hear that this is the promise of the Gospel, that blessing is dawning, 
No matter how many voices cannot speak peaceably, no matter how many death-dealing conspiracies are at hand, no matter what we may think or what our dreams may say, no matter if we've been thrown down into the pit, no matter if we're hundreds of miles from home, no matter if we have no peace, no matter if we are imprisoned, no matter if we are famished, how can we possibly say that? Only through Jesus Christ, who faced death and defeated death itself for you, for us. And so we say with Paul in Romans 8, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. God has something to say. And the word that God speaks is blessing. Blessing that can overcome and undo and remove and transform everything we intend for evil and make it good. And as he looked out over the evening and on the morning of each day of creation and in the dawn said that it was good, in Christ and through the Spirit, the Father will speak again. He'll speak his promise to Abraham. In him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We shall be blessed, not in our power, as if we could make the sun rise but by the dawning of the light of Jesus Christ, who makes all things new. Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to pray and to sing where you are as God would lead you. And ask where it is, where it is, you in the midst of the pit, that God will bring the dawn of blessing today. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Save the community of your people from cowardly surrender to the world, from rendering under Caesar what belongs to you, and from forgetting the eternal gospel amid the temporal pressures of our troubled days. For the unity of the church we pray, and for fellowship across the embittered lines of race and nation. To growth in grace, building in love, enlargement in service, increase in wisdom, faith, charity, and power, we dedicate our lives through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. This time we remind you that there are many opportunities for you to continue to give to the church. You can give online via text, through mail, or you can even come by the church and drop off your offering in person. Remember your church in this time. And if you're watching with us on Facebook, now would be a wonderful time to share the love of Christ with one another and say to one another, the peace of Christ be with you. pray. Loving God, your mercies know no bounds. Though his own brothers threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery, Joseph remained faithful. Though his feet were bound with chains, 
and his neck with a collar of iron. Joseph placed his fate in your hands. May our lives reflect this same devotion in all our endeavors. May our offering be a sign of our faithfulness to you, O God, our Savior and Deliverer. Amen. And now with the confidence, children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. Amen. Amen.